Good afternoon. Um, I'm Scott Taylor from Scheffler, Canada. In addition to serving on the PTDA Foundation Board of Trustees, I'm also a, the chair of the PT Workforce Outreach Committee. Thank you for joining us here today uh, to get all the answers to the question that we've all been struggling with, building a talent pipeline. Where do we go to lock in that top talent? This session is presented by PT Workforce, an initiative of the PTDA Foundation. The mission of the PT Workforce is to develop and deliver tools to support you in attracting qualified candidates and position our industry as a vibrant, um, a vibrant place to establish and develop a career. The world of work is always changing. PT Workforce will help you better understand and manage this ever-evolving environment. In keeping with this mission, we're hosting this session as just one of the many resources available to you. We hope you're going to get some great ideas and information from the panel to encourage you to visit ptworkforce.org for more recruitment and retention to us. We're happy to have Karen Sampson facilitating this afternoon's esteemed panel. Karen is Vice President of Human Resources and Marketing for IBT Industrial Solutions. In her dual role, she leads digital customer experience, e-commerce, workforce planning and development. Prior to joining IBT in 2018, Karen held multiple progressive roles in operations and human resources in education and big box retail. In addition to a variety of certifications, Karen holds an MS in human resource development and a BA in biological sciences. She's current, she is a current doctoral candidate at the University of Southern Mississippi, pursuing a Doctor of Philosophy degree in human capital development. Joining Karen on our platform today, we have three career service directors from technical and industrial programs at colleges and universities to share the best practices in engaging your future workforce before they hit the market. On the panel are Erica Betts, Associate Director, Employer Relations with Vanderbilt University's Career Center. Antoinette Hargrove Duke, Director of Career Development Center, Division of Student Affairs at Tennessee State University. And Nicole House, Director, Welcome Center and Career Services at Nashville State Community College. Please welcome our panelists and Karen Sampson. Thank you, appreciate it. Hi everyone, I think we will have such a wonderful panel today. Um, I know these ladies are working with their teams, their students every day to help really connect the dots between the future workforce and employers. So let's start by just getting a few quick introductions from each of you. And we'll just start with you, Nicole, if that's all right. Sure. Good afternoon, I'm Nicole Hubs from Nashville State Community College. Welcome to Nashville. Um, our community college has just over 6,000 students across six campuses in the Middle Tennessee area. We serve a seven county service region in our area. Um, and at a community college, we have sort of two degree paths that students choose. They either do a two-year AAS degree and go right into the workforce, or a two-year AS or AA degree that sets them up to transfer to a four-year school like TSU or Vanderbilt or any other um, state institution or even out of state. So we have students who are pursuing different paths while they're with us. We also have one-year certificates in many of our programs. We have business and healthcare and STEM and all the general education programs that you might think of that would transfer to a four-year institution. We also have a workforce and community development side of our, of our college, and many um, community colleges have that feature, and those are non-credit programs. So that's sort of separate from the credit side, but some of those students do cross over and end up transferring to a four-credit program. Um, that's a little bit about Nashville State. Thanks for having me today. Thank you so much. Erica? 
Hi, everyone. My name is Erica Betts. I'm the Associate Director for Employer Relations at the Vanderbilt Career Center. At Vanderbilt, we have about 13,000 total students between our undergraduate and our graduate populations. The Career Center supports all undergraduate students and our graduates, or all undergraduates and graduates in STEM and humanities fields. We have four undergraduate schools. We have our Blair School for Music, our VU School of Engineering, our College of Arts and Science, and our Peabody College of Education. So you'll notice we don't have a business program for undergraduate students, but we do have a business minor. And one of our professional schools is the Owen School for Management, so that is where you'll find your more business-focused students when they, are when they are ready to be recruited. So that's Vanderbilt. Awesome, thank you so much. Antoinette? Thank you so much. I am the director of the Career Development Center at Tennessee State University. I've been there for about three years, and um, we are more of a uh, decentralized uh, career center. We have eight colleges, and within those colleges, there are several uh, different concentrations, and our primary role is to support each of the colleges and their endeavors to kind of work with our students. We are the only state HBCU in Nashville, Tennessee, historical black college and university, um, and the president of our great college is President Glenda Baskin Glover. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Antoinette. Thank you. All right, so we are in for a, a really great um, overall session to hear each of their perspectives on, on how to attract and retain new college graduates. And uh, you know, in the community college world, there are lots of adult students too, so how we can start to bring those folks into our pipeline. And I know everyone in this room is well aware of how challenging it can be to attract new folks into this industry, so we'll be really fortunate to hear, uh, hear any of the secrets that you guys have for us, so I, I know it'll be practical. So just to start us off, I think one of the key challenges is managing expectations and the difference between um, you know, what employers are maybe have historically done when it comes to um, how to how to attract people into the workforce and um, and new generations and what they're what they're wanting from the workforce. Uh, so, from your perspective, what does it take to capture the interest of and the attention of the future workforce? I would say that one of or two of the biggest things are really repetition and consistency. Mm -hmm. So being visible on campus is really important for students, especially as most of us have returned to in-person programming and recruitment activities. I think uh, students in general have about an eight second attention span. And so that does go into uh, yeah. how they pay attention to opportunities in the future. So if they don't see your organization's name or brand or logo on campus for even small things where you could just be providing education to them. Intentional recruitment is the isn't the only reason to be on campus with college students anymore. So I would say repetition and consistency are two of the big things to pay attention to for this year, for this generation of students. That's awesome. Uh, other thoughts from Nicole or Antoinette? Yeah. So I think, um, especially for uh, the students at Tennessee State University, it is not a one and done. Um, it is being totally transparent with our student population and showing a genuine interest in connecting with our students. Um, you know, in the recent um, years of things kind of happening with the social unrest and social justice, you know, some companies reached out to us to check a box. And our students understood that. They saw right through it. Um, we do need companies that want to have their names branded on the university. It really isn't, I show up for a career fair, I've done what I needed to do, and I'm done. Um, our students need that consistency and that uh, transparency and being genuine. I'll awesome. echo uh, brand recognition. Um, mm -hmm. I think the idea that some employers might have is I can show up once, I can come to one career yeah. fair, I can post yeah. one job, and then they say, well, why, why hasn't anybody applied to my position? Right. Well, they don't know who you are. You're not on campus, you're not around. And as things have opened back up, students on our campus 
really want more in-person classes. They, they want to be engaged with, with everybody in all aspects of community life and campus life. Um, at a community college, so thinking about who you serve and who the higher ed providers are in your area, a community college mission is to provide service to that community, that immediate community. Most of our students are from the area. Um, unlike a Vanderbilt where they're coming from many states away to come to Nashville. Um, so thinking about being in that community um, and to serve those students and to be, be around and create that brand recognition so that on the second or third visit you're creating some traction and they stop at your table and they go, hey, I saw you last time. You had the really cool giveaways on your table or you, you brought <laughs> pizza for my class or something like that. Um, at a community college, we don't have a residential population. They don't live on campus like they may at a four-year institution. So they're in class and then they're gone. They're at home, they're working, they're taking care of their families. Um, a lot of our students are over the age of 25, so they're very busy people. They're not just hanging around on campus sort of waiting for like an event to happen, mm -hmm. which is very frustrating. We want them to come to things. It's hard. Um, but being around and sort of creating that like, oh yeah, I saw you last time. Tell me about your, about your employer again. How do, you, how do you offer things for a person like me? That's very helpful. That's really awesome perspective. So just to kind of take that to like tangible tasks that, that, that our employers can take away from it, what does that look like in practice? Like what are, what are things that, that we should be doing consistently to educate uh, the future workforce about what kinds of opportunities are available in our field? I'll start with that one. Okay, thank um, you. So it's important to sort of think about, like I said, your, who you're working with at, at different institutions. Erica may do different things at Vanderbilt that I'm going to do, and Antoinette may be doing different things in her office and, and programming for her students. Um, we find that at a community college, um, we have different populations of students who are at our schools. A lot of students who are coming in to Nashville State think, I want to I wanna be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a teacher. There are careers that they know what that looks like. I know what it means to be a, you know, fill in the blank. They may not know what it means to work at your institution, so you have to do a little bit of education on that. So the best way that we have found is to get in front of students in class talks. My office works really closely with our deans and our faculty, and have, we have great relationships because we're on the same team of getting students jobs, um, so we want this to be a great partnership. So we really we work really hard to get employers in front of students in that classroom so that they can hear the great opportunities that you have to offer, because if they don't know, they may not reach out and apply or come to your booth at a career fair. But if you're in front of them in class, they go, OK, this is great. My professor found value in having these folks here. Let me listen to what they've got to offer. So it's really just sharing who you are any chance you can get on campus. And I think I'll say this. And so for those um, that are at the tables with those beautiful pens, you might want to jot this down because this is going to be <laughs> valuable one day, OK? <laughs> this is my 3T model, time, talent, and treasure. Time, talent, and treasure. One of the things that we did at Tennessee State University this year, we um, brought in the largest freshman class. It was 3,500 freshmen. And what we said for your time, we needed help moving those students mm -hmm. in. And those students got a chance to see our university partners come in and simply help them move. At that point, it really wasn't saying, oh, we have a job, we have an internship. Mm -hmm. It was, you took the time to build that brand recognition and you came to the campus and you helped the students move. Um, they brought water, chips, and not only that, it also resonated and connected with the parents. Because when the students then said, well, I can't find the job, their parents were to say, well, we saw some employers there yeah. <laughs> helping yeah. you, uh -huh. you move. And then the time, which goes to getting our faculty involved, we created a program called Crash the Classroom. Mm -hmm. And so that was an opportunity for employers that knew what the industry was looking for to come to the classroom and speak with our students. It was um, executives, those that were experts in that field. And then they took their time and they came into the classroom. They did the lunch and learns. Mm -hmm. um, they showed up during midterms and just root beer and resume. They wanted to review the resumes of the students to get a little more involved. And then the third T is my personal favorite, treasure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Those companies that were willing to invest because your investment might look like finances, 
but our treasure is our students. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. want to set them up for success. And using that model, um, you actually, through your recruitment strategy, can come to us and let us know which element of that model you're really interested in at that time. Is it your time? Is it the talent of your organization? Or is it your treasure? And I'll build off of what Antoinette just said. We use time, talent, and treasures about our alumni population mm -hmm. at Vanderbilt. Uh, we let our development and alumni relations team handle the treasures part of that <laughs> because we really want them to be focused on giving their time and talent yes. back to our, our campus. So we usually recommend having alumni visit campus as part of your recruitment strategy. So coming back, and they're really your best advocates for your organizations. They work for you, so why not talk to the students who are just, you know, they were just them a few months ago or years ago um, talking about that opportunity and talk about your organization. I think another thing that a lot of people don't take a lot of advantage of are on-campus interviews yes. mm -hmm. if you have the capacity or if the Career Center really has the capacity to help with that. Um, and I say that because it really legitimizes organizations' opportunities. There are so many job boards, there are so many Indeeds, there are so many things that students see and they read all the time, but if there is actually an interview opportunity attached to it, on your campus or on our campus, students are more likely to really look at that and apply for opportunities because they know there's something at the end of that, you know, there's a pot of gold at the end of that job rainbow, as it were. So I think a lot of times people don't take advantage of that, but our students are on campus when they are on campus. So why not bring your interviewing opportunities or opportunities for interviews to us as well? And, and I'll just yeah. say this, and this just happened on Thursday on our campus. We did a corporate mock interview day. Mm -hmm. So we had about eight or nine companies come, and our students registered for um, the interviews, and the companies were able to give them feedback. Mm -hmm. So we wanted that environment where, you know, you could make them feel comfortable. You could tell them what they did wrong in a safe space, a safe environment, and the students really enjoyed it. But what I really liked about it was when the companies gave feedback, they didn't just tell the students, they, they let us know. So that helps us develop those programs around those areas that our students maybe needed to um, strengthen some of their skills in. So those mock interviews really were helpful and very successful. So one quick question for you guys with, related to that. Um, how common is that, those types of programs across universities? So I know a lot of our folks here are from other areas of the country. If they're reaching out to their local community colleges, their universities, are they likely to find these mock interviews and crash the classroom, those types of programs available? I think so. Yes. yes. I, think, yeah. I mm -hmm. think everybody does it in a little bit different way. Right. Mm -hmm. but career services, like a huge piece of our job is connecting with employers. So we're going to have some kind of event to invite you to, mm -hmm. um, unless you reach out in like December. It's like, well, we're done for, with programming for the fall. Our students have gone home, you know, they're, right. they're not on campus anymore, but we're, we're gearing up for spring. So engaging early and asking what partnerships are available, what events can, can, we, can we attend, can we sponsor, what do your students need? Um, yeah, they'll have a version of that for sure. And I would say find out what the recruiting cycle is for the institution you mm -hmm. want to work with. So at Vanderbilt, we start on the first day of classes and end on the last day of classes mm -hmm. before finals every fall and spring semester. We don't really do a ton of summer recruiting. Um, but based on different institutions, some start after the career fair. That's their kickoff for recruiting season. Mm -hmm. Some of it is two or three weeks into school. So really finding out what the timing looks like and starting the conversations with the Career Center in the summer to figure yes. out when to plug yourself in throughout the year is recommended. Yep. And I think it's okay to be corny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, some of the names that the students come up with to engage with our um, employers, it's just so unique. Like I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, I cannot go to an organization and call it that. And, and, um, but honestly, just being creative. Um, just like Crash the Classroom, we are tigers and we call it um, Tiger Tip Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, anything that would resonate with the students um, and just really being creative now. There was a gap. I mean, you know, I graduated a long time ago. So when the students are coming to me and they were like, Miss Duke, we've got this idea. And I'm thinking, Okay. <laughs> so as long as you're receptive and as long as you're willing to be creative, um, our students are ready for it. Bring it on. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
That's awesome. That's great <laughs> feedback. So is there like a certain point in a student's college journey that employers should start reaching out? Should it be closer to the time that they're graduating or should we be starting early? What are your thoughts on that? Truly, it depends on the industry, but I think sophomore year is a key time frame or second year of school um, is really key because they're just starting to think about their career journey their sophomore year um, and we are finding that employers want more experience which means multiple internships instead of just the one between junior and senior year like it used to be um, so getting involved with them sophomore year we've even had some ask about getting in touch with our first year students just to get their name in front of them not for recruiting purposes like I was mentioning earlier but really just coming and starting to build their brand with that population of students because by the time they're juniors they will have seen them for two whole years of recruiting um, and then they'll be more likely to visit their booths at the career fair or attend their information sessions so sophomore is probably the key primary area right now for Vanderbilt students but peppering into first year students mm -hmm. so I work with our students and I tell them when they come in as freshmen begin with the end in mind I didn't write that but um, we really want you to start engaging with our students um, as freshmen. Um, students, especially our freshman students, they don't know oftentimes what they want to do. And, and, I, and I think I heard somebody say this, that sometimes you've got to kiss a few frogs before you get your prints. <laughs> so sometimes you got to try um, things early on. And for Tennessee State University, as I mentioned, we had 3,500 freshmen come. It's about retention. What are we doing to keep them? Mm -hmm. So if we don't grab them while they're freshmen, even if you're not ready to hire them in an internship position or um, you know, whatever role, there's job shadowing. Mm -hmm. there's, there are other things that um, we need to do early on to connect with our freshmen. So when you're connecting with them as freshmen, they're a little more ready when they're sophomores. Then you really want to be engaging with them in the, when they're juniors. And then when they're seniors, you already know that student. You've already connected with them. So um, early as possible, that early career intervention always works for us. So our life cycle is a little bit different since students are in a one or two year program with us. So they don't, it's not four years are spending with us. So uh, as often as you can engage with your community college, the, the better the relationship will be. Um, I think it's uh, too late if you're thinking, oh, there will be May graduation. I'll reach out in April. They likely would have already had their career fairs. And some folks who are already working may not even be looking for a position. Many of our students are, are working and they're not looking to, for a new job after they graduate. So engaging early in that, in that school year is better to be able to attend those events that are happening all year round. That's awesome. That's good thoughts. So you know, we work in an industry that is not necessarily at the top of people's list per se. If they don't have a connection to the industry itself, this may not, may not even be on their radar. Is that same timeline as far as engaging with students and early on, is that helpful to educate them about the type of career path they want to go for students who are not necessarily decided? I would say yes. Yeah. I think a lot of students are shifting what their focuses and priorities are in their work. In the past, it was all about how much money can I make as soon as I graduate. Mm -hmm. That is still high on their list of things they're interested in, yeah. but <laughs> benefits is important, stability is important, showing those things to students in your conversations about your opportunities are, are definitely things that students are interested in. So if you can set yourself apart from all the other finance industries or consulting employers that come through minimally, you know, our area, mm. uh, national feels very high for both of those industry mm -hmm. areas. Um, if you can set yourself apart by showing what that looks like, I've worked at this company for X number of years and have grown in X number of positions, that really shows that there's commitment to me, the student, as an individual to continue to grow my career path. No, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. right. And I would say if you're open to hiring students who may have experience in a, in a different field with transferable skills, a lot of community college students have experience. They're a little bit older. They've been working for a while, and they're coming back for a variety of reasons. Um, but being flexible around that class schedule is so important because many students think, oh, I can't look for my real job or my job that's related to my major until after I graduate. 
but there's so many hiring needs in Nashville specifically, everyone's hiring, um, that if they're able to be flexible around a student's class schedule and offer that really competitive wage, that's very important, that they're gonna entice that student before they even graduate. So that's really important to think about too, I think. There is one tip that I would mm -hmm. um, you know, share with you is, when you're looking at the school, one of the things we tell the students is to do research on the company. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in that company, do research. So likewise for the industry. Um, there's so much information that tells you a lot about you know, the academic programs. We have undergrad, we have grad, we have a doctoral program. Do a little research on the university and look at that academic calendar because there are so many things that go on. When we started in August, it almost already felt like the fall had already ended <laughs> because there were so many dates on the calendar that we could not program. It was midterms, it's exams, it's um, you know the fall break. Mm -hmm. And so those are the times that might be a little more convenient for you, but our students aren't there. Mm -hmm. So it's really important um, to look at um, those universities or colleges that you're trying to connect with and, and do a little research. That's great advice. Mm -hmm. So you've all kind of mentioned and, and touched on the topic of salaries and wages, and I hear from hiring managers all the time that new graduates coming out of school have unrealistically high expectations for the salaries that they will get in their first time jobs. Um, but I also know that, that the um, companies that the folks in this room are working for have these long-term career opportunities. What's the best way to connect the dots between those two things from a student's perspective? Like, what should, how should we be talking about that with, with those individuals? And so, you mentioned unrealistic expectations um, from the standpoint of the students. Mm -hmm. well, it, unrealistic expectations for their salary. Is that what you're talking about? That is what I'm talking about. Now, this is something I've heard. Right. That doesn't mean that's necessarily true. And I just want to say unrealistic for the student? No. These students have expectations. Um, if you are working with our students in the beginning, if you're coming into the classroom and you're telling them what the industry needs are and you're developing the students, when the students graduate, then they have what you're looking for. Bring your best offer. Mm -hmm. uh, we have students mm -hmm. right now, and, um, and I know this is being recorded, but we have <laughs> students right now that are walking out of the university making more than what I make mm -hmm. as the director of the Career Development Center. Mm -hmm. One young man came to me just on yesterday. His offer was $95,000 undergrad. And then he got another offer from two other companies. And he said, Miss Dew, they just offered me 72. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm taking the 95, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. They have options. Our students are being prepared. At each of these universities, we get paid to prepare them. We get paid to work with you in your industries to um, equip them for the workforce, to get them ready to come to your organizations. So we do teach them how to negotiate. We teach mm -hmm. them um, to talk about a range. We teach them also that it maybe is not just about the salary, but what about the benefits? Mm -hmm. What about the vacation? What about um, any of those things that become a part of a package deal, a sign-on bonus? Mm -hmm. Don't be surprised if our students are negotiating because we're teaching them that. Um, now, we do understand that there are some unrealistic asks. Well, you can deal with that. You've got the experience to handle that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not unrealistic when our students are being taught, they're being trained, they're working with you, they're working with the industry. You're coming into our universities preparing them. So, you know, when you come, come with the best offer um, because they're ready to negotiate. Mm -hmm. And are you seeing it as pretty common for people to have multiple offers upon graduation? It's definitely a candidate's market right now. Students have multiple opportunities as they're graduating. Mm -hmm. I think also to add on to what Antoinette was saying, these students are still Generation Z, which again, I know we are being recorded. They are um, not, they're 
you have to be patient with them, truly, in the sense that they will come to the table with unrealistic expectations, mm -hmm. but as long as you can talk through that with them, or maybe even avoid salary for the beginning of the conversations in the, you know, to start, mm -hmm. I think that would really draw them away from yeah. that and show them more about what the value of working for your organization is beyond mm -hmm. just what they, their paycheck will be at the end of the day. But these are students who are looking for benefits like remote work yeah. or hybrid opportunities. They're looking mm -hmm. for better health care opportunities. They're looking for more time off. Mm -hmm. They're looking for, they are truly looking for the work-life balance that we've been talking about trying yeah. to achieve ourselves mm -hmm. um, for a really long time. So yes, money is still very important to them, but I think showing all of those other aspects will what will bring the value of your organization to the front of their minds as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a different perspective sure. on that question because we're not graduating 22-year-olds mm -hmm. after a four-year program. Right. So we have students who are of all ages, they've been in school for a variety of years, coming back or it's their first time to come to college and they're doing a career shift. So mm -hmm. the salary may not be the thing that's going to hold them up um, if, it's, if it's a pay cut or it's comparable, but they're getting into their career field out of something else. That's what they're looking for. The challenge that I feel like we have in Nashville is there are so many retail and fast food opportunities that are $17 an hour, yeah. um, and that's hard for employers to compete with. Um, when they could go somewhere else down the street and make just the same. Um, and so we have to convince them that, no, this is in your career field. You're going to school to do this. You're trained to do this. This is a better step for you. But immediately they see that, well, right now I need to make money. So I need to do this instead, or I'll look for that real job later when I finish my program. So that's sort of the issue that I run to with salary and, yeah, and pay on our campus. This is a really good point because I think we're seeing that across the country with increasing wages in the service sector. Um, so, like, are there certain benefits that are, that are most important? Because I would think if I'm looking at it as from a student's perspective, you know, if I'm working fast food or retail, that could be any hours of the day. That's um, not a great work-life balance. Um, how important do you think that those other benefits are to students? So, and I think that that's part of the conversation. You kind of, when you want to know the answer to something, you ask. Mm -hmm. And so when COVID hit, we made this big shift, this, um, you know, everybody was at home. And some companies didn't think that they would be successful by, you know, having, um, you know, employer, employees at, at, uh, at their home doing the work. For me, I think I worked harder at home, so I was so happy to go back to the campus. <laughs> I was like, I gotta get back. But our students are looking for um, that flexibility, that you know, that remote opportunity. Um, even with some of our faculty, we talked about this a little earlier. When the university told the faculty that it was time for them to come back, they were like, No, I'm not ready. Mm -hmm. um, and, but our students were ready mm -hmm. because they missed that um, interaction and just kind of connecting with people. But it's flexibility, it's balance. It, I'm a single mom. I love having the ability to say, I'm not going to come in today because my daughter um, has an appointment mm -hmm. and not have that fear of losing my job. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. definitely flexibility. Um, there's so many other things that students look for now. Um, but I think the best way to find out is when you're having those career conversations, ask them what it's going to take. What do, what do you need for us to secure the bag with you for you to get this um, mm -hmm. opportunity? And remote work is a really interesting topic. It's come up in, in multiple conversations over this past week at, at this conference. So how common are you seeing for offers for students for fully remote or hybrid? I mean, do you see the pendulum swinging back the other direction uh, anytime soon to more on-site work or continuing with remote and hybrid? It really depends on the industry. We, we, we discussed mm -hmm. this before. Um, we have a huge culinary program at Nashville State, and so those are going to be in-person jobs, right? You can't mm -hmm. do that from home. Right. Um, but we've always had, like, medical, uh, medical billing and coding, healthcare management. Those programs have been um, hybrid and, and, uh, and online programs even before COVID at Nashville State. So they were, they're continuing in sort of in that same manner that they have been. So it really just depends on the industry. Um, 
some people will always want to work from home. Some people will always say, no, I want to go in person and, and be mm -hmm. with people and be, be learning and be trained. But now I think we're, we're in this space where it's like, sure, you're going to offer me hybrid? Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. that sounds good. I, I don't mind to be at home on a, a couple days mm -hmm. a week if that's an option. So it's definitely a, a perk that I think everybody should be considering if you're not already considering it for any industry. I agree. I think the flexibility that Antoinette was talking about, not just in the hybrid space, but in that work hours. Mm -hmm. So I do, I'm a supervisor of moms with young young children. Mm -hmm. Their day is not the same as an eight to five work day. They have to drop off their children at daycare. They have to pick them up from daycare. So several of them actually work in the office for like six hours and then go home and work for another two or three hours afterwards. So it's really more about being flexible to lifestyle yes. now and not mm -hmm. just, I mean, we can do our work at any point yeah. during the day. I mean, there are meetings, obviously, we have to take when people's schedules align, but beyond that, we really can do our job 24 during the 24 hours, not for all 24 hours. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's more helpful to be flexible, especially when you understand individual circumstances. You can't mm -hmm. treat everyone exactly the same because their circumstances aren't the same, but it is really helpful to be consistent with your flexibility because if one person asks for it, you know, you have yep. to ask about others. Right. But yep. hybrid work, minimally is where we're probably going in the long term. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thoughts from you, Antoinette? Yeah I, yeah, I think the same thing. I mean, I when we're working with students and, and students are looking for these opportunities, they're saying, I want to stay at home. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I can do my job and I can do it effectively. Um, I will say the National Association of College and Employers has some core mm -hmm. competencies. Mm -hmm. And what we want to make sure is that as long as we are teaching those core competencies, because some students want to stay at home because they really don't like interfacing with people. They don't really like that face-to-face. -face. Um, but as an industry, um, you know, NACE actually connected with industry leaders to find out what do the students need to be very um, prepared for, for your industries. Mm -hmm. And so as we're working with the students in those areas, that's kind of what you look at too to see what it is that they want. And I think that the hybrid, the remote, the money, the, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the benefits, it's all of those things that, uh, that are combined. Mm -hmm. So if I were to sum all of that up, it sounds like you're saying it's the whole picture, then that's what students are looking for. And as employers, it's, it's incumbent on us to make sure that we're staying competitive and that we're offering the types of things that, that the workforce is looking for and, and not necessarily the other way around. So right. good, that's a good call. Well, I have uh, one last question for you before we open it up to questions from the audience. Um, how do we get started? Like where, mm -hmm. who do we reach out to? What, you know, what research should we do for finding what type of school will work best for our industry? What are your recommendations there? I'll start with that one. I would look at the institutions that are in your community. Who are you going to be working with? Is it, is it a community college? Do you have a variety? Like in Nashville, we have everything. We have so many higher ed institutions here, which is awesome. But look and see uh, what their websites share, what, what programs they offer. Um, their enrollments, you can see their graduation data usually of, of how many mm -hmm. students are employed in, um, in those fields upon graduation. Um, so take a look at that and then reach out to the Career Services Office. If for some reason that's not the right person, they'll point you to the right person on campus. Um, and talk about how you can partner together. I think um, in the past it has been employers want to get in front of students and they want to hire, and that's great. That's your mission, that's your goal. But it, I feel like it's shifting, and you guys may agree with this, or, or may not, and that's okay. <laughs> uh, and I think it's shifting to be more of a conversation, more of a partnership. Mm -hmm. what, what can the employer provide to the school? How can the, the employer support the student? Is it, program, is it supporting a program? It may be financially, it may be your time in the classroom, it may be mentoring students. And then also, what, what is the school gonna do, and how are they gonna be able to provide candidates for you to review? So it's really more of a partnership and not just here's a job posting, please send us resumes. I think it's, it's deeper than that and it's becoming um, sort of more, more common to have that. So be thinking about some of those ideas when you have those initial meetings with those career services folks and sort of bring to the table, here's what we'd like to do. What do you guys already have in place? What works for you? Um, and I'll add one more thing. 
that if you're, and I know I'm the only community college person on the panel, and that's okay, um, if, when you're looking at your job descriptions, if a bachelor's degree is truly not required for the, for the position, review that with HR and see if you, can, if you can change that to associates or experience and or a bachelor's um, degree required. Because when students at a community college see that posting and it says bachelor's required, they're turned off and they think, well, that's not for me, even if it really could be. So be thinking about that. That's an easy change that you can review individually with your HR um, folks to see if you can make those edits, because that might open up a whole new pool of people mm -hmm. at a different institution if you haven't thought about that. So I wanted, I wanted to share that before we finish, so you have that to take back. Yeah, that's excellent advice, because I think sometimes, just knowing from HR, we might put that there in, in, as like a proxy yeah. for other things. Same with years of experience mm -hmm. and, and those transferable skills you talked about or likely very valid and, and can be swapped out. Good. Sorry. I would say, yeah. kind of to build off of what Nicole was saying, we're also seeing enrollment down in yes. a lot of institutions. Mm -hmm. Not uh, Antoinette. She's not got all of the, all of the freshman all students, students coming to Nashville, her. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we are seeing students who are going directly from high school into mm -hmm. entrepreneurial roles or yeah. going directly into work. So yeah. to that point, associate degrees, bachelor's degrees, they're not seeing the same financial value in them, mm -hmm. especially because of COVID and the time that they really, you know, they took a break. They learned a lot. They taught themselves things that they could do during that mm -hmm. time, um, but we're not talking just about that, sorry. We are also <laughs> talking about how to connect. So one other thing, there are a lot of state institutions or regional institutions that are similar to what Antoinette talked about with NACE. Mm -hmm. So in our area, we have what's called SOAS, the mm -hmm. Southern Association of Colleges and Employers. And, and that and TACE, so Tennessee <laughs> Association of Colleges and Employers. <laughs> um, and so in those areas, it's a bunch of colleges and schools that are together, but we really don't have a ton of employer yeah. members. And so we connect yearly, biannually, and it's a really great place to connect with multiple career centers mm -hmm. at one time instead of just trying to do individual outreach for your area. So mm -hmm. if you're in a state that isn't Tennessee, they likely have a tennis, like a state mm -hmm. association mm -hmm. that you'd be able to connect with. And reaching out to their membership chair or their professional development chair um, is a great place to start because they'll tell you when annual conferences are, when you can get involved, how you can get involved. Um, but we really love having employers at that association events because we need to hear the feedback and the education from you just as much as you need to hear that or want to hear that from us. So I would say state and local associations are also really helpful for getting involved. And they would love to hear from you. There's <laughs> never enough employer partners in those meetings. So please reach That's out great. to your regional and state organizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, at Tennessee State University, um, we had one of the largest um, career fairs. We had um, 1,200 students that not only registered but attended, and we had over 240 employers. That was amazing, mm -hmm. and we're really excited about that. Um, because Tennessee State University is so big, and we have so many colleges, and because we count on our alums, some of our alumni will come back and they'll make connections with a faculty member mm -hmm. or a professor. Um, and you know they'll make these connections and then the faculty member is in class or um, they can't get back with mm -hmm. them. And then our president is called and they'll say, well, nobody in the career center is calling me back. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And I love my job. So I'm gonna need them to get it right <laughs> when they make contact. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that to say, when you're doing your research on the university or the college or um, mm -hmm. if they have a career center, start there. Mm -hmm. um, most companies will come and they'll say, we just wanna come and you know, connect with the students. We'll get a student ambassador. And then they hold those students accountable for things that the staffs should be held accountable for. Yeah. So I would just encourage you to always check to see if there's a career center. Now some colleges have different um, uh, areas where they have many career professionals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you will need to know that as well. They may focus specifically on engineering mm -hmm. or uh, specifically on um, the College of Business. Mm -hmm. But at Tennessee State University, we have a central career center and we just like to partner with each of the colleges. You may uh, finally make that connection with them, but after you do your research, um, see what that makeup of the university looks like and make those connections because that's where you build those long-lasting relationships. So even if an individual is gone, 
you have a connection with that department. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Great perspectives. So thank you all so much. Let's, uh, let's see if there are a couple of questions out in the audience, if there's anything burning that people are want to ask you, ladies. I see, I see somebody coming. OK, yeah. I'm like, OK. Um, so given the unrealistic expectations of pay salaries, and given that our in business to make money, we always measure the return on the investment, right? So our ROI. Do you guys specifically track the success rate for recruitment for those companies that invested their time and treasures to your guys' institutions? Excellent question. So we absolutely do. A part of our university strategic plan, and this is the, this is the best thing that happened to us in the Career Development Center. Sometimes um, in those uh, colleges, unless you connect your strategic plan with the Career Development Center, sometimes you don't have as much support from the leaders. Mm -hmm. But at our institution, the strategic plan absolutely includes the Career Development Center. So we do track that when we talk about graduation rate. Mm -hmm. um, again, a part of the NACE, National Association of College and Employers, you can pull that first destination survey up right now, mm -hmm. and it will tell you um, where our students are going. Are they going on mm -hmm. to grad school? Are they going to the military? What industry are they going to? And how much money they're making? We use that data. That's why it's important that when industries are coming to the campus, you don't just make um, one connection with one person, because our office is the one that needs to collect the data on um, full-time employment, how much um, students are making, how many offers were received. So we absolutely use that data. We track that data. We need that data. Because if you look at that, you look on our website and you see the dashboard, it'll make you want to come back. It makes the university even that much more attractive because you're saying, we've got some good hires. We want to repeat. We want to go back to that institution. And I will say that we do track it twofold. We have an employer experience survey that happens at the end of every year. So we reach out to our employers directly who have participated mm -hmm. in at least one on-campus program throughout the year to give them the opportunity to share their feedback. And then to Antoinette's point, we have a graduating student survey. So students also mm -hmm. report back. So it's twofold of the student reporting and the employer reporting. So a quick follow-up question to that. Do you see a correlation between employers who um, spend more time, energy, effort on campus and either the volume or quality of the candidates that they end up hiring? I would say yes. Uh, if, again, to Antoinette's point and to Nicole's point too, a lot of times you can see our career outcomes on our websites. Mm -hmm. For the past five years, the top 10 employers are people or organizations that have been repetitively on yeah. campus. So it definitely reinforces the repetition and consistency that I mentioned at the beginning. Wonderful, thank you. Other questions? Oh, I've got one for Tracy, and then Rex will come to you. I have one here, Karen. Um, for those companies who are trying to get involved with a college, whether it be a community or a, or a four-year degree in university, what moves the needle as far as, you've meant, been very clear about the time, but in terms of an investment that a company would have in terms of a donation, whether it's 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, how much, how much investment would you, would you see really moving the needle so that that company would have high degree of visibility and access to candidates? That's a good question. Good question. Well, I'll say this. Um, I attended this class, and uh, um, it was a bunch of attorneys in there, and they said the best answer that they had was, it depends. <laughs> it really does depend. And I'll say that because there are different levels of um, sponsorship. So in the Career Development Center, I've created some employer sponsorship packages. So that's on a smaller uh, level. Um, that would be, we created something called a Career Connection Badge. And so that's where that particular uh, um, employer sponsor can come in and uh, get a cohort of students and work with the students from either their freshman year uh, up into their senior year. 
and there's a dollar amount that's associated with that. But you're um, working with them with their resumes, mock interviews, networking, um, teaching them, um, you know, just certain techniques. Uh, and that, that group stays with you. So that's a dollar amount, right? So that's the one to pin. The other is the amount that you make a contribution to the university. That's when you have a big check and you walk out on the field with Eddie George. <laughs> and, um, you know, there are certain things that go along with that. We do have a corporate um, foundation. Mm -hmm. So there, there are scholarships where you can mm. commit to uh, donating money for scholarships for students. Uh, from research standpoint, there's their buildings, their different opportunities, because TSU it has a high, rich um, volume of research. So there are different projects um, that, that we work on in the agriculture department. So I'm just going to be safe and say, it depends. It's <laughs> a good answer, really. <laughs> I would agree with that as well. It depends on what, if, if the employer wants to connect with a certain dollar amount for a certain program or a specific group of students. We have several that are tied specifically to students who live in Davidson County that are supported by a certain, a certain organization and there's money tied to that. So everything goes through our foundation as well. So it's not as like, Nicole gets a check for the career services office. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. But no, it all comes to the college through our through our foundation to support in a variety of ways. And it depends on what the partners want yeah. that to go towards. Yeah. So I'll say it depends as well. <laughs> Keep that safe. So just a follow-up question to that. Do employers have to start with a large donation or can yeah. we they just start engaging and then build up towards something? Start engaging. Yeah. yeah. At Vanderbilt we don't charge for anything except career fairs. Same. So it's really, you know, at that point it's just the going rate for the career fair registration yep. is what we're asking for. Yep. Um, but we really find a lot of employers find success not even coming to the career fairs because of how big they are. They're intimidating mm -hmm. for a lot of students. Um, so really just coming in and doing some of our services like our coffee chats or office hours is just being accessible to students. I know you asked specifically about money, but in this case, time is really transferring to financial resources. That's a great perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Rex? Uh, I'd like to ask, I, I know that there's a lot of smaller companies in the room, smaller manufacturers, um, and I really like the thought of engaging in a college to get a new hire, but we may only have one opening a year or no openings in a year. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give us to, to engage and what type of engagement would, would you recommend? I'll start with that one. So sure. we, we have small class sizes, we have small graduating classes, so when an employer comes and says, I've got 20 openings, that's very daunting for me and my colleagues because I'm not going to be able to provide and fill that need. That's a lot. It's a big ask. So one-offs, I feel like we're just more successful just for our population. Um, so even if you don't have any hires, you know, in, in, that, in that year, you don't have any openings, just staying connected to the college, reaching out every now and again, hey, how's it going? How's the semester going? How, how are your affairs going? What do students need? Can I come speak in a class? Just keeping that brain recognition, I know we've said it a lot, but keeping that sort of name in front of everybody is, is very valuable. Um, so. I think it's the same process as if you had 20 openings and you're working with a four-year or a two-year institution. Yeah, I would say that it typically takes anywhere from 18 to 24 months to really build recognition on a college campus, and it's likely that you're not going to have the same volume of opportunities during that time. So really just being present and offering your information or even just coming and talking about what it's like a day in the life mm -hmm. to work in your organization mm -hmm. yep. is so valuable for students to hear because they obviously have a, an impression in their mind or they've made up what they, you know, what they think it looks like to work in manufacturing when really there are so many other opportunities beyond just possibly working in a factory or on a line. So the students, we have to help them by bringing you all and to share that information to combat their, their pre, preconceived notions. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, just because it's just one position, what you're wanting to capture is a relationship. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so when you have that, it's easier to come on campus and then say, we have one amazing opening, yep. but they still know you. Yep. You've been present, you've been there, um, you've built that relationship, 
Um, it's through uh, a lunch and learn. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, lecture series that you may just sponsor a motivational speaker to come mm -hmm. and reach the first generation, um, you know, to reach you know, the freshman class or the, the seniors that are getting ready to graduate, they need that, that motivation because not all students leave college with that ideal job. Mm -hmm. So you can begin to speak into them by sponsoring those leadership opportunities. Maybe in your organization you have a, um, you know, a series where your executive may come and talk to the students and then they meet the hiring manager and they meet the HR director and now you're building that brand. So when you do have that position open, it is so much more easier to contact the mm -hmm. career center and, and say, mm -hmm. hey, we posted this job. Can you please just promote that, mm -hmm. highlight that and let the students know that they can apply for it? We're happy to do it. Yep. Mm -hmm. That That's happened awesome. this week on our campus. We had a hire at an accounting firm back in the spring, and they reached back out again because they loved that hire and everything's going well. And they say, great, we have one more. And so it, it'll go like that. Mm -hmm. It'll say, we, we have two now. Great, now we have one more. And so we build mm -hmm. over the years, and then you look up, and we've got 10 grads who are in, yeah. that, in that institution, in that company. So um, sometimes slow is better than hiring dozens all at once. So. Yeah. And, and I'll say to that, we do something that um, it actually started by accident, and it's a spotlight. So every time um, someone in the industry hires our student, we have our student report that, and then we turn that into a spotlight. So now it's on social media, it's on Twitter, mm -hmm. yeah. that's where they are. Yeah. It's on Instagram, mm -hmm. that's where they are. Mm -hmm. We're still on LinkedIn, which is where <laughs> yeah. we need to be. Yeah. It's a professional social um, site. But now by spotlighting that student, we've also branded your company mm -hmm. for free. Yep. <laughs> so um, the spotlight works as well. That's awesome. Hafiz? Hi. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I just keep, sorry. Didn't see One thing light. I Go didn't ahead. hear you talk a whole lot about, I think someone mentioned it, was internships and co-op programs. Mm -hmm. I'm out in California, and I know we do everything differently out there, but <laughs> um, we actually are like begging the schools to have interns or do co-op programs when they're going to get credit, and we can't get any takers. So I don't know if it's a California thing, but <laughs> I'm just wondering, I mean, are they, prom are they normally promoted? I mean, when I went to college, it was yeah. a, you, everybody wanted to try to get an internship. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it has the same appeal anymore, yeah. maybe. I can speak for the, for the community yeah. colleges. A lot of our students are already working, and so it takes a lot to step away from um, what they know and what they're being paid to do to support their family to step away into an internship, um, especially if it's not a paid internship, it needs to be a paid internship to entice the student to, to come do that. Um, so for our, our folks may just not have that in their schedule to be able to mm -hmm. add an internship, even though they want to and they want to get experience, it just may not be an option. But I would say we're having similar um, similar issues in Nashville is there's a lot of a lot of hiring, a lot of openings, a lot of internships, and students are just aren't taking for a variety of reasons, and so some of that is, is unknown to us as well. But um, we're having some of those issues as well on my campus. I think it also depends on the like rigorous level of academics that they're participating yeah. in. Yeah. Our students aren't just taking the three classes or four classes, mm -hmm. they're taking five yeah. and six courses so they can graduate earlier um, and then get out into the real world. So they're really trying, I mean for us internships are still very highly sought after mm -hmm. at Vanderbilt, um, but co-ops, our, our institution doesn't have a co-op program because of how much time that takes away from their academics. So if that, because of the traditional nature of a co-op with, you know, working one semester, classes, working, whatever. Um, Vanderbilt doesn't have that uh, program, but highly, highly recommend and support internship programs. And we absolutely love it. We believe in the experiential learning um, and what we're able to do. We have students from all over. And so sometimes it's easier for us to narrow down the area that has that need for that intern and literally connect with the students that already live there. So when they're coming back for the summer or they're mm -hmm. coming back, it's not a hardship because it's expensive. 
And if you're a college student, it takes a little more than what companies are willing to pay to have them, you know, to transport them there. Um, is housing included? Mm -hmm. How much, you know, um, will they be able to get? So we kind of have to look at the dynamics of what's going on with the student as it relates to the internship, but we absolutely encourage it. Co-op, we encourage it as well, but we allow the departments to be a little more involved in that because the students have to understand it could delay their graduation. Mm -hmm. And some mm -hmm. students want to get out in four. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some students like, I'm good, I'm getting a scholarship. It can be five years, it can be mm -hmm. six, because at the end of that term, they know that co-op is going to potentially be a full-time job. Mm -hmm. So it really, um, research just needs to be done to see if that's advantageous for that student to take those interns because some companies will come and they're just gung-ho and excited about offering an internship and then our students find out it's unpaid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, <laughs> that gets a little challenging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a great thought. So we are right at time. I'm, I know these ladies are happy to hang for a couple more minutes uh, during the break if um, you have specific questions for each of them. But otherwise, thank you all so much. What thank wonderful you. perspective and great feedback for, for this group, really practical. So I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank 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 you. Hey, guys. It's, it's me again. <clears throat> Once again. Um, Thank you very much, Karen, Erica, Antoinette, and Nicole, for sharing your insights and expertise on developing new channels to recruit candidates for building a robust pipeline. 